So today we are very honored to have Professor Yukiko Uchida to give us a talk on self-control and well-being as value systems. Dr. Uchida is Professor of Social and Cultural Psychology at the Kokuru Research Center, Kyoto University. More importantly, she was a Bergman Fellow at CASPUS Stanford between 2019 and 2020. During her fellowship with the Bergman Institute, she worked on a project called Culture and Well-Being from Cultural Psychological Point of View and published a book entitled Thinking About Our Happiness, a Cultural Psychological Perspective. So without further ado, Professor Yuchida, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for Ginny to introduce me. And uh, it's very honor to, you know, uh, have a talk in front of you. So uh, can I share the screen and the slide? Okay. Okay, so my name is Yukiko Uchida, and uh, today I'd like to talk about the, uh, my cultural psychological perspective on well-being and then also the what is the uh, self-construal as a value system. So the, uh, what is cultural psychology? I'm not sure the, how many of you are very familiar with the cultural psychology. But uh, uh, this is area about the, uh, in the social psychology and then especially in the cultural psychology, we investigate how the meaning system in, in each cultural context, such as nation, and the institution, and the community, connects and interact with our psychological mechanisms, such as emotion, behavior, and cognition. So we do the uh, kind of the data collection in the several countries, for example, or sometimes the, just to pick up the two countries, like the US and Japan, and compare some you know, uh, mechanism about uh, like uh, emotion regulation or what kind of the cognitive style we have. And, and sometimes we do the, uh, not only national comparison, but also like a uh, organization com comparison or community comparisons as well, because the, sometimes the unit of the culture is not just a uh, nation, but also like uh, other uh, perspectives should be uh, there in some small groups. And uh, so core contents of the uh, style of the cultural psychology is thinking about is the, how we uh, you know, share the macro process and how they interact with the micro process. So micro process here is the, yeah, we say culture and those institutions and the values. And so if we have some one group, like uh, Kyoto University, for example, we have some uh, system on, and values we share. And then also the so cultural psychology would like to see such kind of the macro process affects the micro process. The micro process means here is about the psychological tendencies or our behavior or our decision making process as well. So such the micro process is the, again, we organize and, uh, um, you know, sometimes to try to change the macro process or uh, sometimes sustain the macro process. So because the macro process itself is very, uh, you know, from the uh, each member's decision makings. So the, uh, I, saw the, I show the four photos, images. This is because like uh, sometimes the macro process, process is more likely to be environment, like a desert or mountainside, or sometimes it's more likely to be, you know, our institutional or human function or system, like uh, this is the uh, city side and how we regulate our behavior at this kind of the uh, megapolis or sometimes the, we try to drive the, the road and the, we coordinate how, how to do the, you know, how to go or we can change the lane or not. This is kind of the each small decision making process, but also like uh, there are some structure or institutional regulation there. So the, I think like uh, uh, culture cycles just have a, the broadly speaking, the two types of the missions. The one is the, rethink psychological universalism. 
this means that the um, maybe before 1990, the most of the psychologists believe that the culture and the psych is very separated thing. And the culture is more likely to be superficial, superficially affect the, our human mind. So if we you know, trim the effect of culture, we can find that maybe core function of the universal mechanism. That kind of assumption is very widely shared at that time. But the, after the cultural psychologist or other, you know, uh, social scientists and saying something like a uh, or group process or culture or social uh, institutional system is quite related to the our psychological behavior or mechanism or thinking style, and it's very quite difficult to separate it out together. And uh, so, and then maybe we have to think about okay, the, so what's happened in the uh, you know, the cultural effect for the uh, several countries. For example, the, so till 1990, um, many people got the data from the uh, American university students and, uh, and everyone uh, tried to apply that kind of a theory to the uh, other cultural context as well. Like um, if we if we used uh, some um, participants from the uh, workers in, in Japan, maybe the, it's a kind of the same tendency should be seen uh, as a, like a American university student. But is it very true or not? So the cultural psychology should show with the data, like uh, uh, what is you know, universal, what is shared, and what is difference? So that kind of the uh, boundary condition uh, should be found from the uh, cultural psychological studies. So this is the first point. And the second point is the, uh, we have to elucidate the process by which culture and psyche construct each other. So this is more likely to be the mechanism issue, like how uh, you know, the culture product the psychological tendencies. So this is the kind of the uh, very, you know, uh, easy example of the what it's the cultural psychology was doing. So uh, this is a kind of the very, you know, beginning of the uh, making cultural psychological theory. So the uh, this is famous test of the twenty statement test in social, in psychology. So please think about yourself. Write down twenty different responses to the question, "Who am I?" And um, actually, this is quite difficult. <laughs> Please try that after this talk, then thinking about the 20 different responses to the question, like, uh, who am I? And uh, people really, you know, thinking about the 10 statements very easily, but after 10, they're thinking, oh, what kind of thing I have to you know, write down? This is very quite difficult. But it's interestingly, there's several, you know, cultural differences uh, we can observe from this test. For example, this is a, a sample description from the university student in the US. They say like, I'm extroverted. I like to make friends laugh. I'm shy. I have confidence. I can, I can do a lot of things. I'm a friendly and very nice person. I'm motivated. I'm the best and I'm incredibly smart and I'm beautiful. And as you can see, this is very, you know, uh, yeah, I got this data from the, some uh, very good universities and the people feel very high self-confidence and uh, self-esteem and they feel like, oh, I am the best. Uh, but this kind of tendency is very, you know, uh, quite connected to the model of the self. Like a, a happy person is someone with high self-esteem, high motivation and high education and high competence and achievements and good social relationships. So this is a kind of a definition of the uh, happiness in the textbook in the social psychology. So I think this is kind of the model of this quite, you know, uh, self is very motivated to the achievement orientation. And from the perspective in the social psychology, individuals have autonomy and place importance on self-esteem and self-worth and establish and maintain good social relationship with others and value free choice and free will and pursue happiness. So it's a more likely to be 
agency model. Agency models is very uh, defined in individuals like a strong um, agent, have strong agency and seek some autonomy and showing their influence to others with their own self-esteem. So, uh, so this is uh, one study is showing somehow like um, uh, flyers, like advertisements is quite uh, different from the uh, culture to culture. So this is the uh, American advertisement. Um, so like uh, this is the small kids and uh, saying something like a good source of iron, zinc and independence. So this means that the independence is quite important as zinc. And then also like uh, this catalogs, the advertisements showing somehow like help yourself. So help yourself and the very strong autonomy and not dependent with to others, you know, image of the elders is yeah quite important. And then also like, uh, uh, yeah, you can, you can do it. This is kind of empowerment approach to see, show some uh, their self-esteem. But uh, as I said, the, um, those data are collected from the uh, university students in the, mostly in the uh, America or Canada sometimes. And those, uni yeah, psychologists try to make some uh, universal series from those sample sampling data. And, uh, uh, and no doubt at that time, but the, um, after cultural psychology uh, showing some data like a uh, uh, difference of the, uh, for example, well-being or self-system and images, the, yeah, many researchers show, saying something like, uh, uh, oh, maybe that we have to see some cultural differences as well to, um, to understand the, what is the psychological mechanisms. And this is a very famous paper, like um, uh, it's in the nature and uh, yeah, by just Joseph Henwick and Steve Heinen and Lara Lorenzo. And they say, most people are not weird. What is weird? They define like a people from Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. So this is weird. And uh, uh, so their main claim is like um, maybe only getting weird data. Maybe we miss something. Uh, not only cultural differences between nations to nations, but also like uh, maybe they miss something in the yeah people in the US as well. Like uh, because they got lots of data from the university students, they are very rich and the mostly elite students, but the, in the US there are more diversity and there's different types of people there, but the psychology missed some data from them. And actually the very, you know, contrasting from the uh, 20 state man test in the obtained in the US, this is the uh, example from the university students in Japan. As you can see, um, their descriptions more likely to be neutral and ambiguous and more likely to be uh, mentioned about the social category. Like um, I'm 90 years old or I'm a university student, something like that. And then also like if they think about, try to, you know, uh, describe their internal state or characteristics, this is more likely to be ambiguous. So like, I don't know whether I'm smart or not, or I'm too much self-conscious well, I'd like to be an outsider, but I prefer to act alone. So this is more likely to be no strong self images, but more likely to be, uh, yeah, they are thinking about the category, social category, and also like they're, they, it's very really difficult for them to define their uh, personality or characteristics as a very, you know, strong achievement oriented self. So this is the cross-cultural comparison data. So for example, that we uh, try to see the number of the self-descriptive statements. That means like uh, um, if they describe about their personality or ability or traits, and then um, among 20, 
it seems like a European Americans is more, the mostly you know 90 yeah 19 uh, mean score means like um, they describe a lot of the such kind of personal traits and abilities but the, for Japanese sense this is kind of the half of them so the other half Japanese try to uh, describe their social category like uh, I'm a university student I'm I'm living in Kyoto this is more like the demographic profile um, yeah, so this is a kind of the rethink psychological universalism. So uh, now I'm trying to uh, show some data about the uh, process thing. So process thing is the, uh, to answer the question of what makes our, our, our culture and self ways. So the many people now, including me, so try to elucidate the uh, origin of the culture and then also like uh, uh, why we maintain some cultural system from the historical point of view. And many people say like uh, China, Japan or other countries, East Asian countries are more likely to be collectivistic and uh, their sense of self is more likely to interdependence. So it's uh, connected with um, other people and also the holistic thinking style. This is more likely to not only pay attention to the one thing, rather maybe they pay attention to the change or pre predictive change or holism, like a uh, uh, good thing might, you know, uh, lead to some negative thing, bad thing, and the bad thing, again, the lead the positive thing. It is kind of the uh, circulation of the uh, in and the yang. And uh, versus like uh, more likely to be the European culture or one of uh, some part of the European culture, I mean, and then also the American culture, it's more likely to be individualism there and the independence, independence means they are more likely to be uh, agency in the inside of their own uh, interpersonal identity and also like analytic thinking styles more likely focused. And um, some people say one of the, uh, <clears throat> interdependence is very uh, rooted by the rice cropping cult cultural context. So because the rice cropping is maybe needs more likely to be, you know, collaboration and uh, social gathering and also the mobility is quite low. So they have to pay attention to the other people in the group for a long time, long, long time. But maybe the individualism or independence is connected to the more like a hunting gathering or sometimes harding as well. They can move and also like a, they can be more likely to be uh, believe their self images and then the strongness when they go to the hunt. So this kind of the uh, historical uh, way of the uh, socioeconomic system might affect their uh, our psychological tendency or macro cultural values in, in the current situation and uh, of course some people say oh but the of course that like uh, for example in japan the roots of the interdependence might be rice cropping but nowadays rice cropping is not so much frequent you know uh, prevailed rather maybe they're doing some you know office type job but why the still the interdependence is very, you know, remained. But it's right, more likely to be, I think, uh, kind of the system maintain such kind of the uh, social or psychological process. For example, the macro environment there and the social ecological environment in the historical essays and the ecology there. And once they established their uh, sense of the, uh, kind of the value is more likely to be embedded in daily practices. So uh, like a language system or policy system or religiosity or law. And uh, we have some uh, kind of the uh, tendency to use such kind of value to educate our kids at, in family or school or workplace as well. So the, for example, I pick up this photo is the image of the Japanese office. And this is more likely to be, they, they pay more attention to the collective activity. So like a rice cropping 
uh, historical origins. So, of course, this is, this is not rice cropping, but their tendencies and the behavior is more likely to be gathering based. Uh, so I think it's maybe because they believe that uh, without gathering, it's very really difficult to, you know, cooperate each other. And this is kind of a strong value system there. And then maybe they try to make another kind of the office or another kind of the uh, group process. It's maybe connected to the kind of the such macro environment as well. And this kind of the pro whole process is uh, of course connected to the macro cycles like emotion, self and cognition. And this is more uh, circulated each other. And uh, yeah. So again, this is kind of the uh, strong hypothesis about the rice cropping and also wheat cropping. The, the, yeah, maybe if you have interested in this kind of the uh, socio-ecological environmental differences, the uh, Tao Helm and his the colleagues showing something like uh, uh, with Chinese data, uh, rice cropping is more likely to be leading interdependence and holism compared to the wheat crop, wheat, because the wheat maybe they don't need more like a, uh, people, manpower. But the rice cropping is the always yeah, thinking about the negotiation of the water stream and so on. So this is more likely to be uh, need more social power. And also the, uh, this is my own study about the, uh, why the uh, interdependence is happening uh, in farming area. And I got the data from the uh, over uh, around 7,000 people living in the uh, west part of Japan. And we found that like uh, uh, in the community level, community means the uh, size of the very small town, like a 100 household in one holdings of one community. And if the community have a, a higher uh, farming place, like a race of farmers, this, this is uh, connected to the participation in the collective activities in the town area. So in Japan, it's still, there are lots of the uh, town meetings and the festivals and uh, yeah, gathering. And it's like, a, I, maybe I don't know, you have such kind of a town community in the US or not, like a block party or elementary school related event. It's more likely to be community. And uh, so it means that the, if the, the community area is more likely to be farming, then the many people join such kind of collective activities. I mean that this is the, uh, both the farmers and the non-farmers join the collective activity. So they, they are more likely to be frequently get together. And such kind of community is more likely to be have a concern for reputation and interdependent tendency. So again, this is showing somehow like a, a roots of the interdependence is connected to the farming area. But the reason why farming promote interdependence is maybe because of the collective activities. And of course, this is the this is multi-level analysis. So community level is more stronger effect. The individual level, yeah, farmers, farm people who are engaging in the farming is more likely to be participation in the collective activities. And then this is more likely to be lead the concern for reputation. But this kind of the and the connection is weaker than the community level. So I think the in that case, the collective activities or daily activity itself is kind of the key factor to convey some cultural values and the systems and to make our um, psychological tendencies. So going back to the thinking about our developmental perspective, not only um, like a socio-economical uh, approach, but also like the more close to our uh, living style, like uh, how to how to educate our kids is quite connected to the uh, building our psychological mechanism and the convey some value system to the next generation. Uh, yeah, I I pick up the some like a co-sleeping example. 
because the uh, in the US it's more likely to be have a baby room and they're more likely to be individualized and independent from the parents that during the sleep sleeping time but in in Japan it's the co sleep is uh, very frequent and uh, this continues until around age 10 to 13 something it's they they sleep together with the uh, their parents and uh, yeah it's kind of the uh, different lifestyle there and then also this is the yeah I got this from my son's the school education system so the left hand side this is the when he was three five years old like a uh, uh, kindergarten and this is my son uh, yeah the, it's back the as you can see they're showing somehow like a collective collective identity like uh, they wear the same t-shirts and uh, this is a kind of the school show so of course their gathering is quite important and also the maybe my son was very slow to join and uh, the teacher tried to put him in the uh, line so it's more likely to be you know not standing out rather maybe you know doing same behavior is quite important so this is kind of training and the uh, right side here yeah he this is my son when he was in the uh, school in palo alto elementary school uh, i i went to stanford with him and uh, this is a very really great opportunity to see um you know education the from the cultural psychological lens and uh, so this is the kind of the uh yeah, first or second day of his moving to the Palo Alto Elementary School. And the teacher asked me that what is his the, your favorite thing to show his classmate? Because he didn't speak English at that time. And so this is kind of difficult for him to, you know, interact with their friends. So teachers, teacher thought about that. So teacher thinking about, okay, the, to show his kind of the favorite or talent to the other persons, that might be very good connection to, you know, uh, have a social relationship between him and other people. So the, and I said, yeah, he played violin. So, and he, and teacher says, oh, this is very great. He should have a recital. <laughs> so this is very amazing thing. Like uh, he played and after that, yeah, this is very effective actually. He got uh, many friends. So, but, this event is very, I think, interesting and uh, uh, very different from the Japanese ideas. So after this experience, I talked about this experience to the other people in the Japanese school, and the, all of them say, oh, this is kind of impossible in Japanese school, because the first of all, playing violin is out of the curriculum. And so bring violin itself is maybe not allowed. And secondly, just standing out is not not good thing for him. So if they from the other other school and come to the uh, class, maybe showing something like oh he's the same as other people is the one of the strategy to have many friends. So this is kind of a very you know different education system there. So if you are interested in, I think the one recommendation is preschool in three cultures. So Joseph Tobin is he's maybe anthropology and developmental, and uh, he took the video in uh, uh, China, Japan, and the United States. And the uh, uh, first video is around the twenty. 1990 and the second video is the revisited like 20 years after the first visit and so he tracked the cultural change as well and uh, they he found out the very different uh, things happened in the preschools okay so uh, so the, those the important interesting things happen in the uh, and what is the theory of cultural psychology? It's a kind of self construal theory. And uh, this is kind of the famous theory. And uh, Hezu Marcus in Stanford University and also Shinobu Kitayama, he is in Michigan now. They published a paper about the self construal and the culture. And uh, uh, they, they depicted that independence, what is independence? This is more likely to be, of course, the self and 
uh, together with others. So the independence does not say that people uh, feel alone, lonely. Rather, maybe the social connection itself is quite important. But the, what is the difference between independence and interdependence is that independence is more likely to be self, is to have a boundary and uh, uh, attri personal attributes or talent or their thinking style is more likely to be you know, from their internal state. But an interdependence model, it's more likely to be in, embedded in the social context. So without social context, it's very difficult to think about who am I, what I want to do. It's, it's more likely to be, uh, yeah, interpersonally influenced and then also triggers of, of the uh, social context itself is quite important to have some agency in the interdependence model. And uh, of course, it's not only East and West, but also like uh, gender or race or social class, regions, workplace, and so on. So this is the uh, from the book of the Clash, you know, by uh, Marcus and Connor. This is also a very good book. So why do we need to understand culture? Um, here is a graph of the uh, GDP and the subject will well being. So the uh, yeah, horizontal lines shown something like a GDP per capita and uh, uh, vertical line showing uh, mean score of the subjective well-being and happiness in each uh, country. So as you can see, there are some kind of the impact of the GDP on happiness decrease after point. And then also the, but large variation among low GDP countries. So even low GDP, some you know, like, uh, yeah, Ingrid Hart suggested this is Latin American culture. So Latin American cultures, they have a, a higher happiness. And also like uh, uh, among the high GDP countries, still there are some variations. So US is right side higher and Japan is the, uh, lower in subject well-being than other high GDP countries. <clears throat> And uh, so cultures, as a culture psychologist, we, maybe we have to thinking about or rethink about the how to interpret this data. So the, what is a life satisfaction or subjective well-being? And actually, um, lots of the such kind of large scale data are using the, this very famous life satisfaction scale. So this scale is more likely to be focused attention to the self, like I'm satisfied with my life or the conditions of my life are excellent and most ways my life is close to my ideal. So it's more likely to be uh, self-oriented and then also the achievement oriented scale. And using this life satisfaction scale and always the Japan and the Korea is lower than other countries. Um, yeah, so when I was graduate student, we conducted the studies about the meaning of happiness. So we collected data from the Japan and then the US and then asked to describe different aspects, features and effects of happiness up to five, and then asked to evaluate how desirable each description was on the five point scale. Like this for each person uh, generate the uh, meaning of the consequences of the happiness, and then they put the score of the desirability of the uh, meaning they generated. And we found that the for American case, the proportion of the positive descriptions, positive description is the, the uh, defined like a higher desirability score. Uh, so we collected the uh, many, you know, generated samples, but most of them, I mean like uh, nine, 90, 97% is positive in the US. It means that the happiness is very positive, positively defined. But in Japan, of course, happiness is very positive thing. So it's over 50% positive description were generated. But it's only around, you know, 68%. And uh, other 30, around 30%, the Japanese 
generated something like a negative or neutral or ambiguous meaning of happiness. It's more likely to be they afraid of the like uh, too much happiness leads maybe negative thing in the future or too much happiness leads some jealous from others or too much happiness uh, leads some you know decreasing the motivation to the self improvement such kind of the negative consequences the connotation that there in the sense of the happiness in Japanese case so with using this. Um, yeah, life satisfaction scale. I think for Japanese, it's kind of just too much of like um, too much satisfied and the condition and the excellent. It's very, they hesitate to say something like that. So it's more likely to be lower down their score. So uh, then uh, I and uh, uh, my colleague try to develop the other items like uh, uh, interdependent happiness scale the focus attention to the interpersonal harmony or ordinariness on the coincidence. So uh, it's more likely to be, yeah, interdependent de happiness case, like uh, I believe that I and those around me are happy, or I feel that I'm being positively evaluated by others around me. And always it's quite average, I have a stable life and so on. So this is, uh, yeah, contrast with the life satisfaction scale, it's more likely to be focusing on the interdependence and then the, uh, or sta seeking stable life, which may be secure for the some sense of the, like Japanese, for example. And use this scale, if you use this scale, it's average is more likely to be flat. So no like a large gap for Japanese and the Koreans to the other uh, countries. So, and also this is quite important, like uh, many other countries of, uh, uh, also value interdependent happiness, not only Japanese, but also the other countries, uh, such kind of the stable or more likely to be uh, satisfaction seeking uh, well-being is quite important. Yeah, so this is the, so far the cultural differences. So the last part of my talk, I'm more likely to be uh, thinking about the cultural change. So existing literature has indicated one of the important macro factor to make psychology is mobility. So as I said about the farming and then the other uh, socioeconomic ecological functions, uh, one of the uh, the di big difference between rice cropping versus herding or uh, gather hunter or gatherer is the mobility. So, but nowadays people move a lot. It's a globalization and this is more easy to spread the one value to the other uh, areas. So, uh, People say mobility is quite important, like a high mobility culture. What is adaptive task is like a, to appeal to potential interactive partners. So high mobility cultures, maybe they have a lot of the chance to, you know, move to the other group, for example. And uh, in that case, to appeal the, uh, please select me is the quite the adaptive. And uh, also the socially desirable behavior is more likely to be independent behavior like self-expression. And resulting macro level shared value system is more likely to be independent. The versus low mobility culture is the adaptive task is not to be ostracized from the current social group because they, they can't mobile and then they have to be, you know, stay stable at uh, one group member as a member. And if, we ostr if they ostracize, this is kind of the fatal and the very critical for their survival. And Japanese working environments, which enhance in collective actions with low mobility. But, so still, I think that after globalization, the Japanese economy system is more likely to be, of course, try, they try to change their, uh, value system to be more likely to be open and high mobility, but still I think it's quite low. Like, um, yeah, especially for full-time workers, it's very rare to move a lot for the, their, and change their job. They, 
um, Japanese hiring system is quite strange. Like uh, just after graduation, like uh, around age 22, they have to get the job the kind of uh, simultaneously the kind of recruitment system. So like a uh, fourth year of the undergrad students, they are so busy to get a job. So because there it's a simultaneous system. So it's a no, no, doesn't have a, such kind of a gap year and they have to re getting in such kind of recruitment process. And after that, after getting the job, the company have some risk, feel the responsibility to train them to be connected to the uh, workplace. So the workplace try to educate their workers as a, a skill connected to their own style. I mean like a skill mobility is quite low and their training system is try to protect such kind of the, uh, keep the low mobility because they, maybe they afraid to uh, people to go out to the other workplace. And secondly, maybe it's also difficult as a macro system like for each employee to move to the other place. So it's a kind of low mobility and uh, as a result, the Japanese workers really pay attention to the sharing task and then also the destiny. Sometimes they say, oh, we share the destiny and it's a really strong words. And uh, yeah, so they pay attention to each other. Like uh, this is very uh, typical office in Japan and uh, they work together like an island, they say, or a line, they say. And they pay attention and monitor uh, each other a lot. So however globalization effect, the job mobility in Japan has increased and have cultural construct on self ways changed according to job mobility. And uh, uh, so we collected the uh, more than 3,000 workers from the uh, 30 organizations and uh, we uh, we did several types of analysis but I'd like to um, uh, show one one of the slides today uh, here the horizontal line show the organization level job mobility so some job of course have uh, some mobility like uh, IT companies compared to the like uh, Toyota uh, more likely to have a mobility. And uh, the vertical line showing the organization level self-construal, like independence oriented. The organization level means like we uh, have a mean score of the each person's data to the uh, each group level mean score. I mean like a 3,000 workers data from 31 organizations. So the each dot is the 31 organization showing something each organization and they have average score from their uh, employers data. So it means that if they have, they have more job mobility, their uh, members of the company is more likely to be independent oriented. So, or maybe independent oriented people would like to go to the high job mobility system. So it's more likely that we, we cannot say it's a, what is cause, what is the consequence, but uh, we just show this is the correlation. So uh, I think this is quite interesting because the, we, on, uh, even within Japan, there are some mobility and the in, independence is quite connected to each other. So again, maybe it's a, after globalization, some people are more, more likely to be go to the independence orientation part. But still, of course, there are some lower job mobility and uh, more likely to be interdependence orientation. This vertical axis means like uh, uh, zero is, in the, in, means like independence is quite flat and minus point is more likely to be their interdependent orientation. So the most cases, their orientations is more likely to be interdependent orientation. And uh, uh, yeah, mob job mobility is quite low. 1.0 1 point, 1 point means the only change the job one time. So the average is around, yeah, zero, I think. 
but the after COVID nineteen, this kind of the collective work style should should be changed, and this is the kind of the on the process is going. So like a Japanese workers still struggling with how to do that. So good behavior regression due to the social norm. They they really uh, concerned about the uh, wearing mask and the, everyone uh, is wearing mask. But there are some dip, several difficulties, of course. Yeah, as I said, their workplace they are monitoring each other, and this is kind of the basic strategy to to work together. And uh, so without monitoring, the some people say it's very really difficult to work together. How to do that? And uh, they are still struggling with the process. And uh, and then also like uh, one day New York Times released that Japan needs to telework, but it's paper pub, uh, pushing office make that hard. That's it's like a stamp. They they have to put stamp to the some digital making process, and the stamp is very you know uh, yeah of course the each stamp has a different type of the uh, calligraphy, so we cannot use the other type of stamp. So they and that. And then maybe uh, Japanese workers use the mask and go to the office and get the stamp and put the stamp to the uh, hard copy of the document. So that's a kind of a ridiculous system. So now it's, yeah, many people try to change to the digital signature. But I think it's not, yeah, lower than 30%, I think. Still, the stamp culture is there. And then also like a, some Japanese company try to uh, devise the uh, monitoring system of the telework, during the teleworking because the monitoring is quite important. And uh, some companies ask the, uh, their employees to you know, show their face always and uh, ask them to sit in front of the computer every time to monitor each other. This is kind of also, again, this is very strange system. But the, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a conflict between traditional system and the new lifestyle. And they, yeah, I think this is a very good chance of the, for Japan to change such kind of a traditional system and the more likely to be flexible. And, but still, of course, the, some such kind of the interdependence itself is the conveying the sense of the well-being. So trim all those uh, traditional system might not be very good for Japanese workers. So maybe having some good balance itself is uh, important in the, uh, in the future system, I think. Okay, so this is the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your uh, attention.